I'm going to invite you to take a seat uh, and uh, grab a Bible or a Bible app and turn to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room, whether at our Sweetwater campus or at Parker, then grab one of the Bibles available. If you're at Sweetwater, then they're uh, in the seats around you. And Parker, they're on a table in the back. Just run back there and grab one real quick or pick one up and turn to page 780 and you will find uh, Jeremiah 29 and be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're at any of our physical campuses and you don't have a Bible, we want you to go ahead and take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. And of course, if you're joining us online, then uh, we want you to have a Bible as well. If you don't have access to one, just communicate that to us. We'd be glad to get you a Bible in some way, shape, or form. Hey, uh, let me just say, Happy New Year. Yeah, aren't you glad 2020 is over and now life can go back to normal, right? I mean, no more, there's no more COVID, no more politics, no more financial struggles or relationship problems or illnesses of any kind, right? Not exactly. Yeah, it'd be, it, you know, it'd be kind of nice if it worked that way, right? Kind of like 2020 was a toilet, you could just flush it and start over. Uh, but it's not that way. Just because the calendar changed, our world is still what it was. The politics are still divided. COVID is still an issue and life is still happening in all of its varieties. And, and we carry on. So how do we, as followers of Jesus, navigate this world? How do we, as those who believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, who believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and and who have made a commitment to follow Jesus with our lives, how do we navigate this crazy, messed up, disease-filled, angry, divided world that we live in? How do we look at 2021 with all of its uncertainties and lack of clarity and confusion? I mean, really, what should we do? Because I know what the temptation is. Okay, the temptation that is brought to us, and for a lot of people, this is the options they choose, it's despair. It's it's to ignore the the realities around them. It's to feel like a victim and like, well, I can't do anything about it and I'm powerless. And, and, And by the way, none of those responses are godly. None of those responses are what God wants us to do as his children, as his followers. That's why I started by saying, hey, how do we as followers of Jesus approach this new year? And uh, what I want to do is is submit to you a plan for 2021. A plan that will bless you, uh, a plan that's going to bless your family, a plan that's going to bless the people in your life. And I'll admit right up front, it's not my plan. Okay? Okay. It's not the plan that I came up with. Uh, It's the plan that God shared with his people about 2,500 years ago. When their world was filled with unknowns and uncertainties and incredible disappointment and absolute disruption. Now, if you're listening in and you're not a follower of Jesus yet, then uh, I want you to go ahead and pay attention to what God's plan is for his people because we would love for you to become one of his people. We would love for you to make that decision to follow Jesus with your life. Uh, So listen in and understand what God's plan is for his people. Now we're in Jeremiah 29. I'm going to pick up in verse 4. And then we're going to talk about uh, what this message is from God to his people. Now this is written from Jeremiah the prophet to the people of God, uh, the Israelites, who are in exile in Babylon. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. 
For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, I want to give you some context, so let's begin by talking about the story. The story. The, the nation of Judah. And you say, well, isn't the nation of Israel? Well, the nation of Israel under King David split into two kingdoms that competed with each other. And Judah was the one that was centered with Jerusalem as its capital. So the nation of Judah, they're the only existing uh, Jewish kingdom at this time, had just been conquered. The, the army of Babylon had besieged them uh, under King Nebuchadnezzar and had won the battle of Jerusalem. They'd broken down the walls. They destroyed the temple of God and they took all of the leaders into captivity. We're talking about the kings and, and the royalty, uh, fa royal family, the professionals, the craftsmen, the politicians, the priests, all of those that were in uh, a position of leadership. If they survived the attack, they were taken away into captivity. And they were brought to Babylon, and in Babylon, they were in exile. They were slaves. But, you know, because they were people of learning and education and status, they were, you know, expected to perform significant jobs as slaves in this kingdom. Now, as prisoners, and by the way, uh, by foot, Babylon from Jerusalem was about 500 miles. 500 miles. It's not like they could just walk back, okay? If they, if they ran away, they, they couldn't get there. So their hope and their expectation had been, understand where they were. They were in Jerusalem. The, the army of Babylon was around them. Their expectation and hope that would, had been that God would deliver them miraculously from the Babylonian army. They had heard stories of how God had done this before and how God had rescued his people when they were under assault. And so they were waiting for God to rescue them, even though Jeremiah the prophet had told them it wasn't going to happen. And so their dreams had been just dis destroyed by the fact that God did not come through when they wanted him to. And so now, in exile, their current hope and expectation, which was fueled by these false prophets that God called out, was an immediate return to Jerusalem. And so their plan was, we just have to survive here and just hang on and not, not invest anything in the future, and, and God's going to get us out of here and get us back to Jerusalem. That was their hope. That was their expectation. That's what they were praying for. However, that was not God's plan. Did, did you catch that? Uh, let me read verse 10 to you again. Because this was like a cold slap in the face to them. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to Jerusalem. 70 years. Years. That is not what they wanted to hear. That is not the plan that they had in mind. I mean, I'm sure they were going, 70 years, are you kidding, God? We're all going to be dead. We won't get to see Jerusalem ever again. And yes, God was serious. And yes, God kept his promise. And in the midst of the pain and the suffering and the defeat and the loss and the dejection of being slaves in a foreign land and having their life ruined, God made the promise. The promise. This is the promise that we know and love and talk about and share and forget that it was given in the midst of tragedy that it was given in the midst of defeat. It was given in the midst of despair. Because I know that none of your dreams of, you know, 2020, you know, were shattered and broken. I know that all of your expectations came to fruition. I know that everything happened according to your plans for this past year. Not. Not one of us. None of us saw this coming a year ago. None of us expected 2020 to play out like it, like it did. And so our plans were, were disappointed. Some of you are living in that frustration. Some of you are living in that anger. Some of you are thinking, God, you failed me. And into that, God speaks 
the promise. I'm going to read it again because it's worth hearing. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's the promise that God gave to the people in exile whose lives were shattered and broken. And, and, and did you hear those promises that God made? He promised to bless. I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare, not for evil. God desires to bless his people. Let me say that again. God desires to bless you. If you're a follower of Jesus, God wants to bless you. Do you, do you believe that? See, it, we, we read the words and we go, God wants to bless me, but a lot of times we don't feel like that's true. I guarantee you the Israelites hearing this at that time did not believe that that was God's plan to bless them. They, they just were like, are you kidding? 70 years, yeah, we're gonna die here. This is God's blessing for us. This is what he wants to do. No, they were defeated, they were captive. And yet God declared that his plans are to bless his people. Can I just tell you that God is working to benefit your life right now? If you're his child, God is, is working in your life to bless you, to benefit you, to, to heal you, to help you, to, to reveal himself to you. He's working in your midst. Now, understand, he may or may not be blessing you the way that you want to be blessed. There's a lot of times that we ask God for blessings and he gives them to us and we kind of reject them like this is not the blessing that I wanted. You ever done that? You ever given a gift that wasn't received well? Can I just confess, I had a Christmas fail this year with my wife. She is so honest, and I love that about her. But I tried something new, and I gave her something, and she opened it and went, oh. All the ladies in this room know that. And, and you might as well just said, nice try. You went down swinging, but it, it was a fail. Look, sometimes that's how we are with God, right? God's blessing us, and we're like, really, God? This is what you want to give me? but his plans are to bless us. Are we receptive to his plans? See, God's gonna bless you. So grasp this reality. God wants to bless you as, his pers as, as one of his people. And then God promises to give you a future. In other words, when, when Jeremiah wrote those words and, and they were read to the captives, he's saying, look, God has a plan for a future for you. They didn't see a future. They didn't see anything but defeat. They didn't see anything but loss. Their world as they knew it had been completely destroyed. Now, can I just say this? I don't really know what level of frustration you're at with the whole you know, COVID thing or with your, you know, the politics thing or with you know, the way the world is right now, but um, your world has not been shattered like their world had been shattered. Their, the exiles thought their life was over. And God told them they had a future. He said, this is not the end. Do not give up. Don't lose hope. And God is saying to us, his people, hey, I have a future for you. I, I have possibilities for you. And, and I want you to hear this uh, today. Look, whether you have decades to live or you've already lived decades, God still has a plan for you. You have a future. You can make a difference. God is wanting to lead you. God is wanting to teach you. And God is calling you to be a blessing in his name to this world. Amen. See, that's a reality. You have a future. And by the way, can I just remind you, if you're a follower of Jesus, your future only gets better. Because, because of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, guess what our future is if you believe in Jesus? It's heaven. And by the way, heaven is a major upgrade. <laughs> so I don't care how good your life is right now or how terrible your life is right now. If you're a follower of Jesus, it only gets better. Yeah. See, that's the promise of our future. And, and the exiles then didn't get that. They didn't understand the reality of heaven, eternal life, all the stuff that was coming. Their future was just like, are we going to survive as a nation so we're going to survive as a nation, but we're also going to be blessed because God is with us right now, but he's going to take us to be with him when we die. It only gets better. So uh, I hope you hear that 
whether life is something you're celebrating right now or something you're grieving right now, God promises to bless you and to give you a future. And God promises to provide hope, to give you future and a hope. Um, the Israelites in that moment were despairing. Hope was lacking. I mean, everything was destroyed and they were giving up and God offered hope to them. And God offers us hope. I mean, we just talked about it a little bit when we referred to heaven. But understand, hope is necessary for life. Do you know what hopeless people do? Hopeless people give up. When you've lost all hope that your marriage can be redeemed, you quit. When you think your family is broken beyond repair, you, you walk away. And they're talking about how pastors across our country are ready to, to quit ministry because COVID has demoralized them. See, when you don't have hope, you quit. When people who don't, don't have any hope, they try to escape. And, and maybe that's drugs and alcohol, or maybe that's, you know, sex or food or gambling, or maybe it's suicide. But people without hope give up. And, and that's why it's so important that God promises hope for his people, for us. And if you're a part of Calvary, or you're watching us online, or you're in the room at one of our campuses, understand that God wants to visit hope into your life. It is not beyond hope. One of my favorite verses that just resonates whenever uh, things look dark and bleak is Galatians 6, chapter nine, or verse 9. And, and, and the apostle says, look, do not lose heart in doing good, for in due time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. There's hope for everyone who's in Christ. Don't think you're beyond God's reach of redemption. Don't think that he can't, you know, heal. He can't change. He can't fix. He, he can't bless you beyond what you even imagine. That's hope. And that's what he wants to give. So then the question becomes, how do we access the promises? How do we access the blessings in the future and fill our lives with hope? Because you might be sitting here in the room, you might be watching online and going, hey, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I don't have all that stuff you're talking about. It's not present in my life, and, and, and I want it to be present in my life. And maybe you're looking at, at you know, the po politics in our nation. Maybe you're looking at the disease, the lack of certainty, the anger, the fear and divisiveness, and you're really wondering, okay, do God's promises apply to me? The answer is yes. But here's the missing piece. God's promises come with conditions. God's promises come with conditions. It's kind of an if-then clause. And you read Scripture and you hear the promises of God and they're, they're usually an if-then clause. If. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Okay. That, that's, a, that's a promise with a condition. We got to confess, right? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so I want to be saved. Then you got to call on the name of Jesus. I don't want to call on the name of Jesus. Then you're not going to be saved. That's how that works. It's pretty simple. And, and, and you read the Bible. I hope you read the Bible. It's full of those promises and they have conditions, and God gives the Israelites conditions for his promises. And, and I hope you noticed these when I read the passage, but I'm going to go back and look at them again and call them to your attention. The first one is he told them to build your family. Build your family. Look, look back at verses 5 and 6. He said, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Now, he was talking to the Israelites saying, hey, make this your home. Do life there. Don't give up the whole family thing. This is gonna be your home for a while, so make it your home. Plant gardens. You know, you don't, you don't get stuff out of gardens in like a week. You gotta be there a while, right? This, this is gonna be a while. So go ahead and take your time and build your family. Okay, that's their word for them. But can I just tell you that from creation, God has made family the very first ministry priority for all of us. 
If you're part of the family of God, then family, your family is your first ministry priority. And so God is directing the exiles, have families, build healthy families. And guess what? He wants us to do the same. You want the the promises of God fulfilled in 2021? Then focus on blessing your family. If your life is not where you want it to be and you're going, okay, I I want 2021 to be better, then husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, prioritize the relationship with your wife. Some of you are going, yeah, but you don't know my wife. (laughs) You may be right, but God does. And he didn't flinch when he said, love her like I love the church. By the way, uh, God is not, he's not clueless about how difficult it is to love some people. Because the Old Testament relationship between God and Israel is God's faithful husband and Israel's an unfaithful wife. So when he says love, he means it. Ladies, you want your your marriage to be better, your family to be better, then prioritize the relationship with your husband. And I know some of you are going, but you don't know my husband. (laughs) Doesn't matter. God does. And he wants you to love him and recognize him as a leader. Parents, you want to have a blessed year? Seek the spiritual health of your kids. Notice I didn't say the material health of your kids. Notice I didn't say the athletic health of your kids. Notice I didn't even say the scholastic health of your kids. Look, all of those are important. But of first importance is the spiritual health of your kids. Are you prioritizing worshiping together as a family? And I don't just mean in the building or once a week online. Are you praying with your kids? Are you reading Bible stories with your kids? Are you talking about your faith with your kids? By the way, if your kids are grown, you have grandkids, are you leaning into their spiritual life? You don't have the the full influence, but you still have influence. You see, as our world spins out of control, healthy families point to the life-changing power of Jesus. And healthy families end up blessing the community. And, and look, if you may be sitting there going, I can't do a whole lot to serve God, well, but, you, but you can love your family, because you can love your family. Then do that really, really well. Do that really, really well. Because the better that we build healthy families as followers of Jesus in Lake Havasu and Parker and points around the world, then the more God is going to use that to draw people to himself. Look, we just finished 2020, and and for all the, the bad news and stuff like that, can I just tell you, we had 236 baptisms as a church this past year. Now, that is, just to put this in perspective, That's over 80 more than we had the year before. Yeah, see, now you guys are going, wow, I didn't realize that. Yes, it was incredible. It was an amazing year. It was the best year ever for baptisms until this year, okay? So, uh, because we're not stopping, we're still sharing the gospel. And, And I'm looking at this going, why in the world were we so effective at reaching people? And I think one of the reasons is because families got healthier. Families got healthier and they started focusing on God and saying, hey, we need God in the midst of this and we're going to do stuff together and we're going to love each other better. And and they worked on their marriages and, and maybe some didn't, but a lot did. And if we can be in our communities with healthy families, that's going to make a statement for Jesus like nothing else. Understand how important it is to build your family. And then the second condition that God gave his people was bless your city. Bless your city. Now, they didn't want to be there, right? They didn't want to be in Babylon. They wanted to be in Jerusalem. They were angry at the Babylonians for destroying their city and killing their friends. And what does God tell them to do? He doesn't tell them to suddenly become guerrillas and sabotage the city. No, look at verse 7. This is insane, but this is what God's plan is. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. By the way, God sent them into exile because they had been disobedient. Uh, And pray to the Lord for its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. If you bless them, you get blessed. Seek the welfare of the city. Can I just be honest? We can't change our world. We don't have the power to do that. We can't can't fix our nation. We don't have the power to do that. But we can influence our communities. 
Calvary Parker is having an impact on the, the, the town of Parker, and you guys are making a huge difference down there, and praise God for that. In Lake Havasu, you're having an impact that is manifest in baptisms and in just the atmosphere in the community. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And then we got points all over the country where people are saying, hey, we're going to be a micro campus. We're going to influence our friends for Jesus. And I hear about people inviting their friends to watch along with them, their family to watch along with them. By the way, we're trying to bless our cities already. It's what we do all the time as a church. Uh, that's why we do serve our schools and teacher appreciation in the districts. That's why we, uh, you know, partner with uh, doing Angel Tree and the backpacks for Christmas. That's why we, you know, bless foster kids and Night to Shine. And, and we bless agencies like Pregnancy Care and Faith and Grace Domestic Violence Shelter and, and the food banks and all this stuff. But, but here's what we try to do mostly. We try to bless families. Families with food, with utilities, with rent assistance, with car repairs, with, with all kinds of things. In fact, here's, here's one of the things I'm most proud of uh, this past year. In 2020, you guys blessed the communities, Parker and Havasu, okay, you blessed our communities with almost $200,000 of benevolence help. Almost $200,000. Can you believe that? You guys have impacted families and changed lives that you don't know about simply because of your generosity and our commitment to bless our cities. You see, we have the power together and as individuals to improve our communities and to lead people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And that's why we serve. That's why we invite you to serve with us because we want to bless our city for in its welfare, we find our welfare. So build your family, bless your community, and then seek God. Third condition was seek God. You heard it. I'm going to read verse 13 again. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Um, we don't live in the promises of God unless we seek the presence of God. Let me say that again. You and I are not going to live in the blessings that God has for us, those promises, unless we seek the presence of God. The only way you seek the presence of God is saying, God, I want to find you. I want to be close to you. I want to have you fill my life. And, and I, I talk to people all the time. I read it on um, the connect cards or the prayer cards. People saying, I want a closer relationship with Jesus. I really want to have a healthier relationship with Jesus. And I celebrate that desire but I often grieve the lack of intentionality. Because it's easy to say, I want to lose 20 pounds, but you have to start working out and eating right, or else it doesn't happen, right? Because a lot of us can testify to that, because we've been saying for like 20 years, I want to lose 20 pounds, and we still weigh the same. See, the desire is great, but we have to have intentionality. We have to do something. You see, the, the reality is this, almost everyone who's watching or listening, whether in the room or online, would affirm their desire to get closer to God, and then most of us would walk out of here and do nothing to make it happen. But God said we'll find him when we seek him with what? All our heart. Could our frustrations with life could our lack of blessings, could our repeated return to our self-destructive habits be because we are living as half-hearted Christians? Let me say that again. Could it be that our frustrations with life, our lack of blessings, our repeated return to self-destructive habits be because we're trying to navigate life as half-hearted followers of Jesus? That we're trying to manage our relationship with God, kind of like we're managing everything else. But we're not completely surrendered to seeking him. I mean, what would happen in your life and in your family and in our community if we made the decision to seek God with all our heart? If you made the decision to seek God with all your heart? Would you like to find out? What that's like? Three people responded. That's beautiful. Maybe it's not. She responded twice, so that's good. 
Now, I mean, see, you know, see, we can, we can talk about this, but, but would you really like to find out what it's like to seek God with all your heart? See, here's the thing, and, and, and I'll just confess. I grew up in churches where we had altar calls. So at the end of the, the sermon, you know, the pastor, you know, would be preaching, and maybe he'd be a pulpit pounder, or maybe he'd, you know, be a, a crier or whatever. But at the end, they'd be like, okay, everybody come forward that wants to make a decision and, and weep at the altar, and they'd weep and they'd pray, and then they'd walk out and keep living life exactly the same way. I grew up watching that happen, and it frustrated me. And I promised God that if I was ever in a position to do it differently, we would do it differently. That's why we don't have a lot of altar calls here at Calvary. It's not because we don't believe God changes lives in an instant. It's because I'm much more interested in your intentional decisions than your emotional feelings. And so I want to challenge you. If you really want to see what God will do in your life, and in your family and in our community, if you really see God with all your heart, uh, I want to challenge you to commit to be transformed. That's the name of our series that we're launching next weekend, Transformed. And we're going to do seven weeks focused on letting God transform the areas of our lives, seeking Him with all of our heart. And, and here's the challenge. I'm going to challenge you to participate weekly in our worship. Okay? With live streaming, you can do it from home. You can do it on the road. You can do it in the room. We don't really care. We just want you to be a part of it. So participate weekly in worship. Join life groups and participate weekly in small group accountability. You go, I don't know how to join a life group. Yeah, you, do. you can walk out the door and they'll tell you. There's all these people out there. It'd be really helpful. Some of them will even recruit you for their groups. Okay? You're watching online and you say, I, I want to be a part of that too. Well, we've got some, some groups that are all online, so we'd be glad to connect you as well. We're even going to have a group here, mass group on Tuesday nights. And you can come and, and we'll divide you up and, and kind of do it randomly. But, but you can be a part of that, but you have to make that commitment to say, I'm going to do it. And then go out there and get a book. Those books are workbooks. They are they're. 50 days of you being in the presence of God intentionally saying, hey, I'm going to read this devotion. I'm going to journal the questions. I'm going to participate. Books cost $5. They actually cost a lot more than that. We're just asking you to, to spend $5 on them because we want a little skin in the game. Again, this is commitment. And if you don't have $5 to get a book, we're going to be offering Financial Peace University next life group session. No, seriously, if you really don't have $5, I'll buy you one, but we're still going to offer financial peace because you need it. Um, the, uh, so walk out there and buy the book. Join a life group. Commit to the next seven weeks to see, seek God with all your heart because he said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Here's the truth. A half-hearted follower is never going to live in the full joy of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you know how scattered our minds are and how divided our hearts are. And today, we just want to repent. We want to say that we're sorry because we see your blessings. We're blessed beyond what we deserve. We're blessed with grace and mercy because of Jesus. We are, we are filled with your love and your kindness. But Lord, we want to seek you with all of our heart. So beginning today, we commit ourselves to you. Whether we're in the room or online, God, it doesn't matter because you see us, you're with us, you know us, you call our name and and we want to follow you. So meet us in this place, whatever this place is. And give us the courage to take that next step of being wholehearted followers of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.